y'all. Welcome to Head Crack After Hours. Now, a lot of times in situations where, you know, your man might have a hot 16 or shorty's making some, you know, some waves on the web, but, you know, but where do we go from there? What's the next step? Who are the people that make the records happen? Uh, you know, right here, man, I got a brother who is a living legend, a man who's getting things done, and, uh, you know, he has a brand new documentary called The Big Hef Experience. That's my man right there. Big Hef, what's going on, baby? Man, I'm, I'm real happy to be here. I'm used to uh, setting up these interviews, not being on them. So, uh, you know, I'm real happy to be here, bro. Yo, it is so dope when people get to be around long enough to actually get their flowers and their accolades because the people behind the scenes, a lot of times, people don't know who they are and they're not celebrated as much. But, you know, because everybody always sees the end result, which is the talent blowing up. And you're one of those people who have been responsible for getting so many people from ground level to just completely blowing the spot up out the door, man. Where did it begin for you? Um, you know what? I got my start at Land Speed Records. My dude, Mike Moves, they gave me an opportunity to work at Land Speed Records, and they had put out the first 50 Cent project. And then um, I was always big into the DJ community. So, like, I started off with Who Kid, uh, Mick Boogie, and Joey Frankers and DJ G-Spot. So it just gave me a chance to get into the DJ community, learn how, like, they move and operate the business of being a DJ. And then I kind of took it over into the mixtape scene. Then when they went into the mixtape scene, I learned about distribution and, and, and sales and all that other good stuff. So, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that brought a lot of nice things and I just kept going and, and, and really got to making my relationships and music. Now, for a lot of people who maybe were born at the end of the nineties or, you know, you know, dare I say the early two thousands, Let's paint the landscape to how the business was back then. When you know when you was really starting to get rolling, the budgets were illustrious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah. it, it, it was a different time. It was easier to get things to go, man. How was it? Uh, it was real crazy because it was just so much money floating around, and people would just spend money on everything. You know, anything that they think that could make happen or would possibly happen they were definitely spending money on it so it was street team promotions it was uh lifestyle promotions it was radio it was like it was like a lot of stuff but uh like the biggest thing like on my end like i said i started off just doing like mixtape distribution so i would do like a lot of the new york djs and i would do a lot of the midwest djs and we was making like ten dollars a tape you feel me so that was just like that was like being an artist on our end so it let me know about sales and then how much money was really involved in making these projects work. Cause you know, like I went from doing the mixtape, the DJ mixtapes. And then I started, you know, fast forward, start uh, going into the Houston music scene. And that's when I started meeting like Paul Wall or Mike Jones and Chameleon Air and Slim Thug and learning about their, like we would push their stuff. And, you know, actually where I met Megan's manager, T. Ferris, he was from that whole era. So that's how we, we got connected. Now, you know, being in 2021, you'd be hard pressed to like find a, a physical CD in too many places anymore. You might luck up if you go to a certain gas station in the hood or whatnot, but it, it was such a different time. So seeing how, how steady flowing the money was back then to watching the mixtape scene kind of erode away as things got digital and the money wasn't there, what was going through everybody's mind, you know, as it related to trying to figure out a different way to transition and pivot to keep the money going? You know, like I used to watch, uh, I was a big fan of Joe Buttons and um, Amagam Digital back in the day. So when they first became the first digital record label, everybody was kind of looking at them like, what? And I was like, let me see how it works. You know what I'm saying? So I had put out a, a couple, you know, I'm from Cleveland. So put out a couple Bone Thugs and Harmony projects to them just to see how the digital landscape would work and kind of learn the process of what they're doing. And, you know, I kind of just started getting into it, bro, like early on. So I was like, let me try to put out some records through there or even a lot of the new artists that were physical artists trying to get them to move over into digital. Got you. Now, there's a whole bunch of talented people all across the country. And, you know, a lot of people might have that record that, you know, I people in the hood love it. You know, maybe even got a few plays on SoundCloud, you know, with, you know, some impressive growth. At what point or what move should they make to, you know, I guess, take their, their buzz even a little bit higher once they kind of got that, at least that initial, you know, buzz going? 
So what I would do, like if they initially created a story, so I started something called the Streets Most Wanted Tour uh, back in 2010. And it was basically like uh, creating a groundswell for newer artists. So I would take them to either 10 or 15 cities and, you know, I would start building those relationships in, in a different market. So with DJs, with retail stores, with lifestyle stores, uh, at nightclubs, with promoters, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of those artists that um, that we kind of took under that wing, they ended up becoming, you know, very successful artists. So just because, you know, I, I believe that uh, for any artist, if you got 10 or 15, like, uh, dependable markets for you, then it's nothing for you to expand on. You know, for people that are watching this big half, how important is it for artists to get out of their comfort zone, get out of their cities, meet these DJs, make these relationships? Uh, it's, a, it's so important. So, like, you want to become a bigger artist, you know, in each market that you open up, like, especially now with digital, like, you can really go to Spotify, go to Apple Music and see what your top 10 or 15 markets are, but you still got to go visit those markets and make those connections. So that can only uh, explode. Like it, it adds a bigger story on you once you're in there and you're touching those fans and you're touching those people that can actually take your career from. Let's say if it's at a 10, it could be at a hundred. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I really believe in that. Okay. Now, a lot of people out there walking around with tons of talent, but don't have the money to put into proper promotion, whatever that looks like in 2021 now, because it, it changes every you know few months what you need. Like you know, a few years ago it was like about getting on the best blogs, you know. Then it you know you know years before that is like, all right, cool. Who can you get to work your records for you at least at mix show level at radio? What are the things that artists need to be looking into now to invest in? more so than like their jewelry and how, you know, or how to, you know, their, their clothing line, you know, cause you gotta be able to make those relationships forge and, and, and be on the radar on other spots. Yeah, I mean, I really think like with the streaming aspect of it, it gives you like that, that relationship or that information before you even leave the house. So I would just say definitely get playlist programs and um, build some relationships at Pandora, you know, like, build some brushes with head crack like it, it like all of that stuff makes a difference because if they're not talking about you then um it's kind of like you know, one in a million a lot of people with talent it's a lot of people just doing their thing but nobody's talking about you as the next one up then kind of like sitting in your own house chilling bro. like nobody <laughs> yeah that's no fun at all and you know and big half you you wear a lot of hats you know and when, and when i tell people about you I don't exactly know how to describe you, I, like, but other than, you know, the, the biggest thing is like hard work and dependable. There's been so many times where like you've physically brought artists to the station and you, yeah. you was responsible for doing the driving, you know, and, and you, you, you posted up, you know, downstairs, you sent them up, you made sure everything is good. You know, what title do we throw on you? Uh, right now, I'm just moving into the title. Like, I used to just do a lot of promotions, but now I'm just finding the talent. Like, uh, last year, I did an imprint. I mean, I did a partnership with my guy, Brooklyn Johnny. So, I did a joint venture with RCA and started my own label, Capital Structure. So, now, like, a lot of the talent, if I see it, I want to be able to sign it and put it under my, un underneath my own roof. Um, I felt like I gave a lot of talent away to a lot of majors, but, you know, you live and learn and you know, we're here now. <laughs> and then your big shout out to Ty Bree. She's a part of your situation, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ty Bree was one of the first artists that I signed. I was having some success with a lot of female artists. You know, I wanted to keep that momentum going. Now, you, you mentioned artists that you gave away to other labels. Now, who's one artist that you helped get hot that when you think about it, you're like, damn, man, I should have kept them with me. Oh, um, it's a lot. It's, uh, there's a new kid by the name of Watson Flo last year that I really had my eye on. Um, you know, he ended up signing with Republic, so uh, we're still cool, we're still connected. We're developing some other artists and stuff together, but it's been a lot of big names. You know, if uh, it's a lot of number one artists, so I wanted to I want to drop no names out of them right now. <laughs> you know, we live in a show and tell society. You know, the, the cats is like, say it, say it. You know, it's a lot of female artists that's popping right now. It's a lot of uh, crossover artists too. So I've been getting busy though. I've been getting busy, but I just believe, like like you said, I just believe in the work and then just staying with it and then helping develop those those artists with those good dreams to, to take their careers to the next level. 
No doubt. Now, I send a lot of people in the direction of your DJ coalition, man. Big shout out to everybody over there at the Nerve DJs, man. Y'all have been doing a lot of great work for a long time, giving cats a platform to, you know, get on, whether it's on internet radio or like even with the mixes that, you know, have positions. Um, can you speak to the importance of, you know, DJ coalitions, you know, as it relates to, you know, where we're at right now in the music business? Because a lot of times people don't get a chance to meet these people because the, the, people aren't doing market visits like that. And some people don't even know how to contact a DJ coalition. Um, I really think it's important because the DJs are still one of the front lines of <laughs> transitioning you out. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's right now, I feel like there's a lot of a uh, big plenty of streaming artists, but it takes like the DJ coalition. It takes like radio and, and touring and stuff like that to convert those artists to be like, you know, bigger artists, like super mega star artists. So um, I think that the DJ coalitions are really great. You know, like I utilize them, I still utilize them to this day, just so, you know, every artist I know wants to hear their song in the club. They want to hear their song on the radio. Most DJs that DJ in the club usually are on the radio. So, you know, you got to make that relationship, uh, begin that relationship. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there still in the pocket with the, uh, the old school demo mentality like hey if i get my demo to blah 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 we about to be out of here from this point uh that's not really the times we live in anymore like you know for someone to get on your radar or anybody's radar from from a record label what needs to be happening for that artist to make that kind of noise um they just gotta have for me they just gotta have some buzz and then just some kind of creativity or star quality about themselves so like i i've really believed like sell stories instead of selling music so they got to have some kind of story or some kind of personality that's going to carry them a long way so when i look at like party and i look at like the baby like their personality stands out down there like some of the bigger artists on the planet so you know i think artists got to have that they got to have that right now now nah, it's a very important thing it's like you know it's getting to the point now where i feel like there's so many people that are actually good at rapping that more so now than ever, being the best rapper isn't necessarily what's going to put you over with the people, you know, because I'd imagine there's probably some things that you work that, you know, hey, I know this will work, but maybe it's not particularly what you enjoy listening to. But right. they had the other things that made it work. Like, you know, what are some of your personal faves, like, you know, stuff that you listen to, you know, when, when Big Hef is off the clock? Um, you know. I go through my generation, so it just depends on, uh, you know, what kind of vibe I'm in. But I'm a real big, like, Tribe Called Quest and W.A. Bone and Wu-Tang as well. Um, and then if I get into the, the 2000s, I'm going Drake, Lil Wayne, uh, Rick Ross. And now I, I live, listen to a lot of uh, Lil Baby, Future. Um, and then, like, I listen to a lot of up-and-coming guys, like uh, four from Blackie Chicago. I listen to... Uh, like Polo G, just like you know, I don't, it, it don't it don't come through my persona, but a lot of street music <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know, variety is the spice of life, they say. But you know, but that's how it was back in the days. So, you know, when you said that you listened to Tribe Called Quest and NWA, by a lot yep. of people's today's logic, it just seems like it's on opposite sides of the street. But yo, back in the days, you would go from like Ice T to De La Soul to. You know, maybe like maybe some people were still listening to Houdini. Kid and Play used to tour with NWA, right? You so know, by I, reference. That's what like I, I'm. It's a yin and a yang, so it just depends on the vibe that I'm in. But I like like at the beginning when I thought about creating Capital Structure, I wanted to create a 2021 version of Lyrics Lounge. You know what I'm saying? Like that, from the today's market, you just don't get a lot of that. So, but I still want to sound like a hip hop guy. I also want to sound like another street rapper. That's a dope, you don't hear too many people say that, you know, especially in, in this day and age. And I know you've always, you know, the fact that you even worked at Landspeed, you know what I mean? Like Landspeed had like, yo, a, a super grimy roster. My very, oh snap, it's actually right here. My very first 12 inch came out on Landspeed oh. Records. Oh, wow, that's what's up. <laughs> that's I got reports up. that said we sold a lot of copies and never got a check that. But <laughs> the fact that, you know, yo, like, you know, there was nothing cooler than being able to say, you got to wreck it out. You know yeah. what I mean? It, the, the, the energy that comes with that is an amazing thing. Yeah. I, like, it just taught me, like, about just the diversity of a label. So, you know, you want to 
you want to open up things that are appeal to a different market. But like that that first lyric, that I mean that lyricist lounge roster, like heavy. You know what I'm saying? Like they staples in hip hop. You know, so I always just think about diversity appealing to different markets, and um, you know, you still want to keep like the stuff that you came up on alive. So that's why I, I'm really heavy into like the hip hop. So I love what like Dreamville is doing and TD is doing. Just keeping it keeping that up. You know, you think back in the days, there was so many labels that were dynasties. It was kind of like, if you knew something was coming out on Def Jam, let's say through 85 through, I'd maybe say to 92, you knew what it was. You know what I mean? Same thing with Def Row. If it came out Def Row, you knew what it was. Cash Money, No Limit, had a run. How important in 2021 do you think it is the label that you're signed to versus who you are and what you're doing? If the label has built a brand and a reputation for just like just putting out quality or having some kind of mission statement, I still believe that is true. Uh, from like just the younger artists that I deal with, they don't really look at that stuff. Anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's weird how that shift just kind of happened out of nowhere. Where like you know your label minute, it seemed like it maybe peaked. I almost want to say like Young Money. You know, yeah. when they kind of had a little bit of everything and then, you know, TDE, you know, people to some degree are checking for everything that comes out on that label. Then now it's just like no man's land. And, you know, long as people, you know, as long as you make it a record that people want to hear, they just gravitate towards the artist and not the whole umbrella. You know what? I think like some of the things is just like the, the a lot of the label heads, like the music guys, they kind of went and started their own friends. They realized like, oh. You know, uh, record labels and stuff like that. You know, just like smaller imprints. And that's, I mean, that's really what I feel like the, the music guys, the, the big execs, they went because I've seen like a lot of even like the penalty records and profile records and all those guys, they relaunched record labels just because now it's not, not so much overhead to put out records in. Yeah, nah, like, you know, the digital definitely took a lot of weight off the physical copies and having to, you know, invest all this type of money to make sure you had product. It's a lot. And just hearing you talk about these labels I haven't heard about in years is just so dope. You're such a wealth of knowledge, man. Like, there's very few people that I can have this level of a nerdy conversation with. Like, you remember when Nervous used to just come out with 12 inches? You're like, <laughs> such a, I'm wearing a duck down shirt right now. I mean, like, I'm, I'm all about the indie labels, man. Because, you know, the cats was getting it out the mud and, you know, and some of them are still operating and thriving. I hate that we don't have the raucuses no more. You know, I know they did like a digital relaunch, but, you know, the magic wasn't 100 percent. We wanted to be. I heard Louds trying to make a resurgence. They're, they're definitely making a resurgence. So, I mean, I just I see like, you know, it's really up to kind of like the a &Rs and the artist development people now just to bring those artists that they're discovering on the net to life. Um, you know, like I said, it's really big on like personalities, right? Now. So um, I'm I'm here all for it. That's you know, I, I said let me get in the mix and start me something. You know. <laughs> well, big so. big half you your music guy. You you you're a dude after my own heart. I love the, the the energy and the TLC you put into everything you do. So let's walk everybody through here who might be an artist watching from the time the song comes out of the studio. Okay. What the next steps that need to be taken so they can get to you um boom so the song comes out of the studio of course it has to get mastered then i'm going to uh play it for a certain amount of taste make see if it works if it actually is a record that we can push and i'll probably take it to the club and take it to the dj and see what kind of reaction they get just to test it out those things are a go like both of the tastemakers and are messing with it, then I'm, I'm full steam. I'm coming up with a plan, probably hollering at some digital streaming parties to see when we can launch this off right. Uh, and then I'm probably planning a tour around it. So if I release a record saying it's called Let's Get Head Crack, then we're going to start the Let's Get Head Crack tour. So if I put 20 or 30,000 into a record, we're about to try to make that bread back. Whoa. So, you know, most people, when you say $20,000, $30,000, they throw in the church finger up and they walk in the other way. So 
you know, two people who have no mysterious dope money to clean up and are trying to figure out how they can get the kind of money to really get a record to take off. What are some creative avenues and outlets could they, you know, utilize to, you know, invest in themselves, you know, logically and, and, and with, so with the possibility to get a, a return? The internet is free. You feel me? So it just that's your energy play. Like that's just your effort and energy play. So you can start off by doing freestyles, you can start off by doing TikToks. And you know, if you on that joint or you and your friends, if it's five or ten of y'all, y'all working on TikTok or y'all working on, on, on Instagram or YouTube, then that could become your thing. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I just talked to an artist who you know, nobody was paying attention to his music. So he started a YouTube channel, started interviewing people and then just sprinkling his music in. Now, every video he drops gets two or three million, two or three million, two or three million views. And, you know, now he's a content provider and he's, he's a money generator and like not going away. You know what I'm saying? So it's just your effort and energy. So you don't really need a big budget. You get, you gotta have some effort and energy into it too, because that's the creativity of what's going on with the young, do- young dogs right now. Like, they're really after it. You know what I'm saying? So be just as hungry with them. So if they tell me they're doing that kind of stuff, then I'm like, okay, let me put, it, put this extra, you know, seasoning on it, and then we're going to dress it up and make it dope. Now, you mentioned, like, you know, like doing, um, you know, club runs, testing it out in certain spots just to see how it reacts. But every now and then you get, like, kind of those artists who aren't your traditional mainstream artists, but you know, they have a certain type of appeal. You know, you talk about a group like Earth Gang, a J, yeah. a Logic, you know, not necessarily club staples, you know, barely getting any radio play, but they have a built-in audience that's rabid. You know, like if they throw a show, they selling it out. How do, you know, what kind of process or steps do they take to, get, you know, get that same type of push? So like, you know, I'm really big into esports. So like, I know when we did Logic, like one of the things, it was logic that was really dope is that he came up with an idea of, hey, I'm not doing no clubs, but I'm still willing to do market visits. So let's just see if we can put together a gaming tournament. Let's see if we can put together house visits for some of our biggest supporters or our super fans. So he would literally go there, play his music while they're playing video games, have a good organic conversation, and that goes that goes major. And, you know, especially if it's the bigger uh, gamers and stuff like that, you know, they might be playing a video game and listening to music and there's two or three million people or four or five million people watching, you know what I'm saying, or listening in. So you got to just think, you know, outside the box and just come up with different ideas. But, you know, like some of the people that are typically club artists, then I might take them, like if they're a musician, musician, I might take them to a, a jazz club or a music spot where like the hipsters and the vibey people are, are hanging out at, and, you know what I'm saying? And it's going to react the same. Or I might just put at a lifestyle spot, do a listening party for them or something. You know what I'm saying? Like energy going to attract good energy. So people going to come out and support them. So a boutique approach to every individual project to get the desired results. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, That's the I'm way trying, it should be. On record, I'm trying to put out the next hair crack project. What's popping? Yo, let's talk about that ASAP, man. I'm, you know, like, yo, we, you know, we got some cool things cooking up over here. Like, uh, actually, I got a verse that I'm waiting to cut that I just sent off today that I'm waiting to come back, you know, for this next uh, this next batch of things I'm working out. So we definitely going to build, man. Like, I love how you move. And I love, I just love the fact that you guys have helped so many people. You know, like you, Nerve DJs, man. Shout out to uh, Johnny O. How's he doing? I, I, you know, I know he, he was uh, wrestling with COVID, uh, you know, a few months back. Is he doing okay? better he's back at it he's going out to dinner every day he's just celebrating life so i'm i'm really happy i was worried for a minute and like that's my big brother so I, I just i was praying every day texting his wife every day family just checking on him but you know he just asked me for a rolex the other day so i i, I told him he got to sit on the sidelines right now <laughs> Not the gold watch, man. So you know, you got the Living Legend Award, man. How does it feel, you know, to be recognized, man, while you're still ten toes down and still got energy and passion, you know, behind what you do? You know what? It feels great. First, like I was really uh, kind of standoffish because you know you don't want to never never get that old head label put on you and all that kind of stuff. But I really feel good that 
the younger wave, like my, I call it like my generation, like my generation of people that I help uh, bring up, you know, have really, you know, embraced me, supported me. Um, and, you know, it doesn't hurt to have like, you know, a lot of gold and platinum artists that surround your side. So, you know, they just really just been embracing me. Just knowing that if they do the work, then the results will come in. So I'm, I'm happy about it. Indeed. And also, uh, you know, tipping my hat to the community stuff you're doing as well. You know, you got the uh, Believe Land, Stop the Violence Seminar, Q Time, you know, school programs and whatnot. And I know with COVID, you know, doing what it's doing, I know it slowed some things down. But uh, are these things still up and running or you got plans, you know, for beyond all that? So I just want to I just like I, I kept it going. I'm, I'm keeping it. I keep it going. But I just want to tell the youth like there's other routes, you know what I'm saying, a, a success than going the street route. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I want to make sure that's a staple in my life, a staple in my community, is always giving back and talking to the kids and let them know they got options. Indeed. You have changed a lot of people's lives, man. And uh, when you think back on everybody, whose life do you feel like you've changed the most? I really. Like, music just helped me, bro. Like, I ain't gonna, like, no cap, uh, you know, like just seeing, like I was just talking about it with Me about Megan Thee Stallion, just meet her in 2017 at South by Southwest, me and T Ferris being longtime friends and just seeing like what a mega star she's become, um, seeing T Grizzly, you know, go from just getting out of getting out and then just starting to like hitting the ground running. And, um, you know, even like Machine Gun Kelly, just seeing him, you know, work in the store in Cleveland and now, on a punk rock side, he got a number one album. So I'm just seeing like a lot of success around me and I feel good to uh, know these people and then also be a part of their career. You know, music has always been there for people during the best of times, the worst of times. What song do you listen to when you're sad? Sad? Uh, man, what do I listen to when I'm sad? I'm trying to be happy all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. What's the record that I listen to when I get it? Um, man, I don't even know. I don't even know, bro. Like, it's probably some pain record by Meek Mill or something like that. Okay. Sure. Now, let's just say if you want something that's going to pick up your vibrations and make you just, you know, feel great about yourself, what's your go-to record? Um, go-to record right now is uh, the, the, the Little Baby Bigger Picture record, for sure. Yo, it's amazing what that record has been able to do. Not yeah. only for like, you know, the streets, but, you know, it made the labels realize, oh, conscious rap can be profitable again. I'm seeing a lot of people try to capitalize on that wave and, you know, try to match the success because you know, people have been saying what Lil Baby's been saying the longest time. But it's dope that somebody who is at the heights that he yeah. is to do yeah. it and, and catch fire, man. That's real fly. It was, it was real crazy. Like when the riots broke out, like they didn't have no go to record for that to to. to, to connect with the emotion of the community so they pulling out records from like the 90s and all kind of stuff and i'm like we need some records for our gen like this is our generation bro like this we need this and, you know he he came with the right perfect timing so i appreciate that one. well yo man for the people who's aspiring to the people that made it yo shout out to the people behind the scenes to get it to go man big half salute to you and also be sure you make sure you check out big half he has a documentary out right now tell us a little bit about that real quick it's just uh going through the career of big half it's called a big half experience shout out to um johnny lump shout out to uh, wise mind productions um but it's, you know it's just telling the journey it's going through the land speed it has a lot of stuff that was going on right now with like dream doll and uh T Grizzly and Megan and all that kind of stuff, but it also takes you back to like the Shady Records days and like the underground stuff and just how I, you know, just transitioning, pivoting through the career. So, you know, I'm really happy. At first, I was nervous about it, like I said, because I didn't want to get like that old head, uh, you know, God label on me just yet. It's like, give me like five or 10 more years. And I'm just, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was happy i got you know it always made me feel good because i got the little i did a screening and show people and it's like an hour and some change and uh you know people start clapping at the end of it so i was like okay it wasn't that bad because i was like oh man i hope they like it <laughs> yo you know like it, it's inspiring stuff you know just to show 
the other side of the game. You know, not everybody has to be on the microphone rapping. There's so much magic on the other side of that mic, too, that a lot of people don't get a chance to see. Like, I imagine when you rewind back, like the first plaque that you got uh, from assisting an artist, you know, to get, you know, reach success. Do you remember what plaque that was? Uh, no, not the first one, but uh, one of the monumental joints was the, this, this Jeremiah plaque that's in the back and uh, just because he's from Chicago, it's a Midwest thing. Blood, sweat, and tears, like really going hard body with it. So, you know, and I'm a fan of his as well. So, you know, I'm, I am I still get up every day, you know, not eight, nine o'clock, excited to get to work. So I'm I'm still happy to be 10 toes in it. And I, I think like this is like the beginning of another phase of my career. You know, it ain't work when you love what you do, bro. Sure. <laughs> Completely random, not for nothing. About a year and a half, two years ago, I was chilling. I was at Or I was at Orlando Universal Studios, and I walked by somebody. I was like, "Look, like Big Hef, can't be." And then, like a couple days later, I like looked on your IG, and you was <laughs> Universal Studios. Like, oh man, <laughs> I ain't never seen you in a tank top. I was I was throwing off, man. <laughs> like, I never see you in like in relax mode because your grind always be so steady. You know what? I, I took the fam out. I took the family out. You know, you know, just it was like one of those moments. I took the family. I was like, "Listen, we haven't had a family vacation in forever. Let's go to uh, Universe Studios. Let's go to uh, Disney World. And let's have a good time." And I took the family. You know what I'm saying? So, I wish I would have known you was there. We could have went out at nighttime because usually they was they was tired by eight. <laughs> Yo, that was the game plan. I would run it. Like, we would hit everything multiple times. And like, you know, but eight was the time to go out. But like, shoot, I ended up getting tired myself, man. But <sighs> man, I, I, it was just one of those things like, nah, no way. <laughs> You know, I just kept, I just kept pushing, man. But you know, small world, man. But yo, big half, much love to you. We gonna definitely keep connecting, and, and thank you so much for paying so much attention to the futures of yeah. these artists, man. Like there, there's so many people who don't know what to do next, and you know, without you know people like your involvement, cats would still be on SoundCloud. You know, you know, without all the accolades. Yeah, man. Listen, I appreciate it. I'm really humble, uh, even to, for you to take the time to do the interview. Uh, I always wanted a head crack interview, and I appreciate you for giving Tybri a shout out in your morning show too, bro. I always salute it. People always hit me up like, "Yo, head crack just gave Tybri a shout out." I said, "Oh, that's my dog, man." Yo, Shorty was dope, man. Shorty was dope, and anything you co-sign, man, I rock with a hundred percent. Like I still talk to Jay Manson on occasion. You know what I mean? You know, like you know, you you, you surround yourself with dope company. I just want to be around. I, I listen from where I'm from. Like Jerry Levert was one of the greats, so I want to be that, and then I want my name in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to go down, you know, on some exec side stuff and just what I did for Ohio. So I'm really on it. I really, you know, I believe in positive energy, and like I said, I appreciate you, my G, for sure. Yo, my G, you help people in anything that I could do to help you get your name in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yo. We running the marathon together, baby. So let's get it, man. Sure. <laughs> All right, man. The future's yours, man. One time for Big Half, if people want to follow you and check out the documentary, where do they go? Uh, on YouTube, the Big Half Experience, um, and then on social media, Instagram, Big Half Midwest Fresh. I really believe in the mid Midwest. And on Twitter, it's B-I-G-H-F. I appreciate you, my G. Sure. God bless you, my man. Appreciate you, Half. Yes, sir. Peace.